All right, Phil Reardon, Touche Cult. This is a long time coming. I'm excited about this interview. This is a reunion of sorts. I mean, me and you catch up a couple times a year, I'd say. And you're, let me preface, you're an OG member of Second Brigade. That was the design team over at Arisu. We had some amazing times there. And your support for design. Many people prior to that might know you from music. In fact, you were gonna be a subject matter for, I think, the season that never really launched. Yeah, I think um, we ended up doing some stuff. And so, uh, kind of covering you as a, as a musician, your photography is off the hook. That's probably a big pull for a lot of your current projects and agency work. But if you're meeting someone, tell us about your story. Like, like what do you do? How do you introduce yourself? I guess the initial thing that we all fall into is like, you know, I'm kind of like this jack of all trades. like. You know, my first real spin in the world came in the music industry, you know, I started off in music management and then in a band and just really carving a path for 10 plus years, touring, developing, writing for my own band and then my friend's bands in the past. And, and in that carried me kind of into like the apparel world and the design world because all our bands always needed layouts, merchandise. And then as we were playing bigger shows, you've got, you know, the brands that come in and want to do collaborations with you, but you're like, oh, your brand imagery is not really aligned with us. And then I'd be like, oh, well, what if like I designed a shirt we actually liked and we like, you know, I get points on the sales. So like you start getting your art placed in massive stores. And then you're also, instead of, you know, your typical design rate you get for like a, a band wants one of your graphics, you're getting these checks and you're like, I'm making eight, $9,000 royalty checks off of a t-shirt with a company like Atticus and Macbeth or, and you, the, I guess like the businessman in your head pops off and just goes, ooh, this is good. So, and then um, I ended up coming back out to California for a while from a buddy of mine who was in a band and lived in this producer artist house. And so I was out there kind of working on music and just opened everything. I was designing. And one of the guys in the house had a design agency and he was like, hey, I need some help. So I started going in his office, helping him. And they want to work on, you know, kind of like a a web series TV show about a bunch of guys, you know, that are kind of tattooed and uh, just kind of like hellions, the, you know, the bad boys um, that were into streetwear and stuff and apparel, but also into food. And we were working on a thing called Food Beast. This food at one point became such a culture to talk about as much as apparel was, as, a, as much as music was. And everybody wanted to know the cool spots to come eat at and, you know, who were the, and then the chefs started to become rock stars. You know, you had these chefs that were getting TV shows. And so, that happened and oddly we ended up with a place in downtown santa Ana in the arts district and lo and behold right around the corner from my doorstep was the arisu office and we the initial connection was via wally and richard wally was definitely a foodie because you know i am king was right down the road from us and we had andy over all the time and you know marilyn when she was shooting for them and we were always kind of popping together. And then, you know, we'd start getting the DMs from Wally like, oh, that's like, that's my kinfolk. How? I think I was starting to do my office work over at y'all's office just because I liked everyone's vibe and y'all were cool. Me, you and Mikey definitely had like a synergy off rip. And then just all of a sudden it came into, we were all had these ideas we could bounce off each other. And I think just that little ping pong for me to have a whole group of other actual creatives to get ideas of how to make Food Beast edgier and cooler. And then I had this rock and roll image that, was helping to spin into what you guys were doing. And one, a huge shout out to you because when I first was messing around with the graphical ideas of Touche Cole, you were like, hey, what are what is that stuff you're, you're posting online? And I was like, oh, I don't know. It's like pictures of my cat, just weird stuff that I'm making like edgy and dark. And you're like, hear me out. I think you should put those on t-shirts instead of just posting them as essentially what became memes, you know, like these graphical things. And I was like, oh, you think, and you're like, yes. Then the original idea was you wanted to document the process, make the case study. I, I wish we would have, because that first year was kind of crazy. And I remember you were like, dude, one guy, no funding, no anything, top to bottom, you do everything. And I was like, oh, bet. Start mocking it up. And then I go to Amanda, because I want t-shirt shot. And you're like, no, 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 one guy, you got to learn to shoot. And I was like, but I don't shoot photography. And you're like, well, you shoot video so you can do it. And then in that, I just started getting hit up more and more and more for the photography because all the stuff I was shooting lookbook wise, the people my relationship put me in the room with, probably where people know me most are those the, between the music and like the food beast and apparel. And then now like the photography and like, I'm shooting a lot of commercials at an agency. It's like a lot of like 
back into like the cinema world, music videos, commercial work, you know. Something super big, like it makes me think that was maybe a golden era in, in, in Orange County at the time, and specifically Santa Ana was popping. Uh, I did an interview with, with Andy Wynn not that long ago, the homie Andy Wynn, and he had the I Am, Ki I Am King office, right? King, then we had Bespoke was right there when they came in. You guys were a street, and the Food Beast office was just a straight, was like one street up. So you guys were there, so it was popping at that time. was was a really good time. The, even the bespoke guys, when bespoke first started doing his hats, are really yeah. cracking. And you go in there, and, and we're like hand to hand, like cutting, stitching out stuff, and cutting patterns, and sewing this up. If I go down your feed, there's tons of models, which obviously helps on both parts. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and you shot with some some really big figures. But how did that happen? How did that? How did it come to now? Like agencies are like knocking at your door now. The specific group I would say that if I had to like pinpoint where the, the eyes on what I was doing really came from that, the group of like Burning Angel and Suicide Girls. These were girls that were like burlesque tattooed models, I, some adult industry, way pre, you know, only fans and stuff. Well, some of these girls had, you know, a million followers, 10 million followers, and they liked my brand. They liked my old band. And then they would go, oh, hey, I see you have a clothing company. Would love to shoot with whoever your photographer is. I like his work. And I was like, oh, I don't have a photographer. I hadn't really adhered to the idea of me taking photos. Man, I was a photographer. I literally only shoot to create content for my clothing company. And they were like, oh, oh. And they were like, well, what if we paid you? Could you take some photos of the girls not in your stuff? which felt like it was I was dumbfounded because I didn't see a purpose in shooting photography other than to create content. Hugest shout out ever to my sister, Angela Mazzanti. Um, when she first came to Orange County and came to live with me, she came via one of the suicide girls I was friends with. And she had like a shaved head with a mohawk. And she was like, oh, I'll take some pictures in your stuff. And I was like, okay, cool. And the first second I started shooting her, she helped me really grow as a photographer, like, you know, she pushed me to get better and better and show me work of people that she liked and figure out if I could see what they were doing to get these looks. And she was always available. If I made a shirt and went and got one printed, I'd be like, hey, come downstairs and pop the lights up and we'd put it up online. She'd post it and all of a sudden my PayPal, ding, 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 ding. People were trying to pre-order it. And I was like, this is a cool system. And I was doing flips that made sense in the hip hop community as well as the punk rock community. Like when I did those Trap God shorts, I want to say it was ASAP Ferg or ASAP Amp posted them on like a HBA type board. And all of a sudden in like three minutes, those sold out. And those were like 50 bucks a pair. And it was like 144. And it was like, I just woke up. It was like at $75,000 in my account. And I was like, what the hell just happened? Somebody posted, was like, yo, these are fire. Cause that was back in the Pyrex day, the basketball shorts and yeah. And I was, I think they they could probably look and go, this kid's a little punk rock, but he's also a little hip hop. You know, I wore gold teeth every day back then. And one of the girls I ended up dating long-term and we were, uh, ended up uh, engaged. Uh, we got her on America's Next Top Model. And she's uh, still to this day, probably one of the dopest models I ever have and ever will shoot. Dynamic, alien, chameleon, bald head, cause she had alopecia. And I was now shooting stuff that I could, I would look in a magazine and see like this, you know, uh, Louis Vuitton or Gucci ad or like some Aqua Di Gio ad of a girl in the desert with that was a model model. And then as we were able to get her on America's Next Top Model, um, I mean, her entire portfolio was mine. We took her from being a workshop model to a full on fashion model on a major syndicated TV show. So every eye that went to her, when they go check out her page, cause they're popping up, boom, at Gina Turner, every episode, it's like 90% of her stuff is mine. And it's like, well, who's this guy? And all of a sudden it's like, Hey, we want to book you to shoot this. And I'm like, okay, cool. Can my girl be in it? A brand doesn't also just want technically what you do. They kind of want your finger that's on the pulse. They go and that fingerprint that gets left on every technical thing you do, people know, hey, this is done by a real one. Oh my God, so much good jewels, dude. The, your story is incredible. The coolest thing about photography is no matter what you want your end piece of art to be, it is absolutely possible in photography. With photography and Photoshop, anything your brain can dream can can look physically tangible. And that's what captured me. Oh my God, that's a freaking quotable right there. So amazing, a ton of good things for people to learn about from you uh, and hear your story. So where's a good place for people to follow your journey, bro? www.philipreardon.com. Philip with two L's, I'm sure you'll spell it out. But um, uh, that's typically, I don't update as much, but that's like where a lot of like my freelance portfolio exists. Um, 
Instagram at at Touche Colt, T-O-U-C-H-E-K-B-L-T. Dope. Well, uh, we're going to be watching. Uh, you're, anytime you can use this as a platform, if you want to put any kind of, anything you're doing in front of 25,000 people, um, you already know. I mean, we're, we're homies like that for real. Yeah, so thank you for your time, bro. We appreciate you. I appreciate you having me here, man. I want to thank you, bro. And uh, we will see you guys on the next one. All right. Much love always, brother. I love you.